Hello, everyone. I'm Minister Newsom with New Hope Baptist Church. We welcome you uh, from our pastor, Dr. George L. Parks, Jr. We want to thank you for tuning in, and we're going to share some with you on today as we continue uh, throughout this week to be conscious of what is happening around us. But we want to continue to have the uh, option of not only hearing his word, but knowing what's necessary as we continue to wait out this situation, but knowing that God is in control. So today what we're going to do is share with you from the book of Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Um, in Luke chapter 11, starting at verse 1, today we're going to talk a little bit about generating power in prayer, because we know prayer at this time and this date uh, has uh, been upon a lot of our minds. But with prayer, how do we know that prayer is working? And so today we're going to talk about generating power in prayer. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. We're just going to concentrate on one verse on today. It says, And it came to pass Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he had ceased praying, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. Um, with this, there is a story that I heard some time ago about a man named Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And a tour group wanted to come to his uh, church where he was pastoring and tour his church. And so they came to him and said, would you come and show us the uh, most powerful room in the church. He says, OK. So he takes them down toward the basement into a room and he takes them to a prayer room. And he said, well, no, no, no. We thought that you were going to take us to this large sanctuary, this beautiful sanctuary that we heard about. And he says, no, that's not what you asked. He said, you asked about seeing the, the most powerful room in the church and the most powerful room in this place is the prayer room, because I know and believe that when the church starts praying, things start happening. Uh, let's talk about prayer just a little bit today. Prayer is not a mystery. Their prayer is not a mysterious thing, yet God has made prayer so simple. We have actually made it complicated with all of our questions. We're always trying to figure out and wonder if God is going to, what can I do to get God to answer my prayers? So we're going to start out with a definition of prayer. A definition of prayer is the channel of communication between the believer and God whereby God's power is released into the earth realm through the combination of the believer and the word of God. Let me say that one more time. Prayer is the channel of communication between the believer and God, whereby God's power is released unto the earth realm through the combination of the believer's faith and God's word. Now, in biblical times, in the biblical stories, you always heard of people uh, praying and releasing power, God releasing power on the earth by prayer. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, where Hannah prayed uh, while she was infertile, but she eventually became fertile. Even in Acts uh, chapter 12, verse 5, where Paul was praying in the dungeon in prison and he got out. It always happens between the believer's faith and the word of God. Prayer is our lifeline to God. Now, prayer can not only be fruitful, but prayer can also be frustrating. Um, have you ever had moments in time in your prayer life, and I hope you have a prayer life, but have you ever had moments in time in prayer that you don't feel like your prayer is getting anywhere? It doesn't feel like your prayer is even going past the roof. It feels like your prayer is just not going where it really could be. And, and sometimes it can be frustrating because I know I'm supposed to pray, but yet there are moments when it seems like your call is not being answered by God, by God seeming like God is not on the other line, seems like God is not listening. Uh, how do you keep praying when nothing happens, uh, when nothing is going on in response to your prayers? It seems frustrating. Even like now today, you're praying for the families of coronavirus. You're praying for this virus to go away. You're praying for things to ha start happening with people getting back to where to normal and and people getting and, and being uh, in, infected, if you will, with this virus. And it seems like nothing's is happening. Even in your personal life, it seems like nothing's happening. Your child is still acting up. It seems like things are still happening in your marriage that uh, that's not productive. It seems like you're even being overlooked in promotions on your job. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but it, it happens to me. And even so much so when you pray, it seems like and I'll just speak for myself. I'm not going to speak for you, but it seems like when I pray that I even get distracted myself. 
when I distract myself, I distract myself with my inability to stay focused. Um, seems like when I'm praying, <clears throat> and I pray, and all of a sudden, I'm praying serious about something, and something jumps in my mind that ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. You know, I, I'm praying, and I pray about, uh, and something jumps in my mind that somebody said to me two weeks ago, or somebody said to me uh, a week ago, or have I completed my shopping list, or what I'm going to wear today, or what, what I'm going to do in the next hour. It seems like I, I, I'm, I'm getting pretty deep into something. It seems like something jumps in my mind that I have nothing to do with my prayer. Have you ever been there? Has it ever happened to you? So it looks like, and it seems like, I need lessons in prayer. In the text, <clears throat> one of Jesus' disciples, we're not told which one, comes to Jesus and requests to learn how to pray. The text indicates that he observes Jesus praying. And once Jesus finishes his prayer, uh, he says to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray. So what we're going to do today is find out and look and learn how to have an effective and powerful prayer. First thing we want to, to look at and talk about is establishing a correct attitude about God establishing a correct attitude about God because powerful prayer starts with a longing for his presence and not a looking for answers for your problem. Let me say that again. Powerful prayer starts with a longing for his presence and not a looking for answers for your problem. Too many people sometimes think prayer is magic and they can rub on a bottle or something can happen. And the only time you go to G or go to pray is when you're in trouble or when there's a situation and when you want to go to God for him to fix something. Powerful prayer starts with a longing for the presence of the almighty God. Just knowing that when I pray and when I go to God, he's going to give me the peace that I need. Being in his presence is what motivates me. So the question is, what motivates you to pray? Now, another question, too, looking at this is, what led this disciple to ask Jesus this question? He was watching Jesus pray and obviously he was blown away by what uh, Jesus and how Jesus was praying. And he saw, I believe, a longing for God. Because if we look at the word prayer, the prefix for prayer means to lean toward, to lean to God. Because if you're leaning to God, you best believe God is leaning to you. In other words, God, you lean into God and God is leaning to hear what you have to say to him. So, so knowing that you're praying and whatever effort you're going toward God, just know that you're going to get the reciprocal action, the reciprocal response from God that you're giving to him. You're going to get it back from him. It means that I want him as bad as he wants me. I, I want to embrace him. And I know that he's going to embrace me right back. Whatever action I lean toward God, I know that he's going to reciprocate that right back to me. So the question is, how intimate are you with God? How serious are you about leaning toward God? It means I'm coming in his direction. So if I'm coming in his direction, I know God's direction is going to be coming toward me. Now, some say I've been praying about my bills. <clears throat> I've been praying about my child. Or maybe the problem is. You're leading with that and you shouldn't lead with your problem, but you should lean toward God and toward his presence. So in this scripture, the scripture in this scripture, he says when he said, teach us how to pray. Uh, Jesus starts out with the prayer and he says, our father, which means that he recognizes and he says and he acknowledges who he is. You acknowledge the fact that I'm in the presence of an awesome and almighty God. And so so when you concentrate on God and when you continue to lean toward him, all of a sudden your problems become small. As a matter of fact, when I get really deep into the Holy Spirit and really going toward and, and praying to God, you realize how small your problems really are. You, you, you realize that what you have in front of you is mightier than anything else that might be beside you. So the, the question is, when was the last time you were in his presence? Now, I didn't ask when the last time you was in church because you can be in church and not be in his presence. Uh, let me see. You remember when uh, Jesus was in the crowd and the woman with the issue of blood touched him? And Jesus said, who touched me? 
And the disciples were saying, well, Jesus, everybody's touching you. What do you mean? Who's touching you? Everybody's touching you all around you. But he says, yes, everybody's touching me, but not everybody's getting something from me because you can be in church and not be in his presence. You can be in some other places, but not be in his presence. Listen, when you're in the presence of God, no matter what is all around you, nothing matters but his presence. Everybody may be doing everything else, maybe concerned about everything else. But when you are in the presence of God, nothing else bothers you because bothers you because you are in his presence. Second thing is to establish a connection with God, establish a connection with God, because you can belong to God and not know how to talk to God. Um. One of his disciples, as we look at this this passage, passage, this one, uh, this is a disciple of Jesus Christ. This he was anointed, he was appointed, he was someone who was admits that he is one who's selected by Christ, but he admits he has no clue how to pray. Now this is in chapter eleven. Now he's been with Jesus all through this time. He's he's uh, healed the sick, he laid his hands on the sick, he's called out demons, he's. He's preached the gospel. He's done all these things for Jesus. But he says, I really don't know how to pray. The question is today, do we really know how to pray? I I mean, I know we speak words, but do we believe the words that we're praying? Um, Because praying the words, you have to connect them with your faith, faith, because most of us pray words without having the faith in those words that we pray. Because we're praying because we know that we're supposed to pray. I mean, we are supposed to eat. We know that we're supposed to eat because we have to eat. But sometimes we pray just because we know we're supposed to, but we don't have that believing faith that we need in prayer. Scripture says, and even in Mark 11, chapter 24, believe what you say and believe what you ask. But here's that in context. You don't get what you say if you don't believe what you're saying. But if you're going around saying it and you believe it and you believe it and you're not seeing it, it's not about saying what you see, but it's about saying what you believe. This disciple is saying, Lord, teach us. He says, I've been around you. I've been empowered by you. I have do things for you on your behalf, but I don't know how to pray. Now, I'm sure this passage is suggesting that this disciple uh, hasn't tried to pray. You got to understand he's a Jew. He's devout. He's done a lot of religious practices. He's prayed before. Uh, But what he's saying is that I've done the activity, but it shows no evidence of authority. Hmm. Let's assume this disciple has a prayer life. Uh, The thing I like about this disciple is is that he actually examines himself. He actually has to be honest in his spiritual walk that there's something in his life that needs improving. I mean, here's what it's like. He's a devout Jew, means that he's been praying. He, he's asking Jesus uh, how to pray. And here's, he's not blaming God for his inability of his prayers not being answered. In other words, you know how the enemy does sometimes. He said, well, God is punishing me. That's why my prayers aren't being answered. God is, is doing something. He doesn't love me and all these things. That's the trick of the enemy, because uh, when you're praying with the right faith in mind, the activity of what you pray begins to come into your atmosphere. Listen, he doesn't blame God because obviously of the question he asked and who he asked, because he knows who actually has the power. Because just because you belong to God doesn't mean you know how to talk to God. Examine yourself, examine your belief, examine your faith, because you may have to make sure that your will is going to be in his will. Trust God as you pray. The last thing we're going to talk about just a little bit is establishing inclusion with God. Prayer is powerful when its scope is communal and not individual. Let me say that again. As you establish inclusion with God, prayer is powerful when its scope is communal and not individual. There is a there is a grave danger in the new church of individuality. It's all about getting something from me. It's all about mine, getting me, me, myself and I. And and even in Genesis, God said, 
It's not good for man to be alone. In other words, it's not good for people just to be by themselves. I, I know that uh, even in your home right now with all that's going on, you may find yourself by yourself. And God has actually developed you to be an individual. You're not a fraction of a person, but our best uh, self is seen in relationship. Now, here's what I like about this disciple. He comes to Jesus. He doesn't say, Lord, teach me how to pray. He doesn't come as a representative also as uh, for the group to say, teach us. He says, Lord, teach us. He comes by himself and he says, Lord, teach us to pray. You need somebody in your space, somebody in your group that is going to be praying for you without you actually having to go to ask them to pray for you. Go to the Lord on somebody else's behalf to pray for them because you have to be willing to be committed to somebody else's excellence without them having to ask you to pray for them. You should always be going to God saying, God, I not don't want you to just bless me. I want you to bless someone else. I want you to be a blessing to my neighbor, blessing to my brother, blessing to my sister. I don't care how jacked up they may be or how messed up you are. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a necessity for us to pray for each other. We are called to pray for each other. We're called to ask God to bless each other. We're called to ask God to save other people's children, other people's marriage, to heal other people. And when you do that, you get your focus right. You're no longer concentrating on other things that are happening around you. You are praying for your neighbor because in this scripture, he's saying, I don't want to be the only one blessed in this circle, Jesus. I want everybody else to be blessed as well. And if I don't get the blessing, I'm going to celebrate for the other person who gets the blessing before me. I may not get what they get, but I love the fact that they've got blessed and I am going to be just as excited about them being blessed. Because God, when you bless them, I know and believe that I'm next. I know and believe that that you own the cattle of a thousand hills. And that means no one else has a corner on the blessings. No one else has the only car, has the only job. You are the one who can bless me as well as somebody else. And, and I love the fact that this person, this this disciple said, teach us. As John taught his disciples. Now, it's interesting going to Jesus, the master teacher, in, in a sense, saying, well, Lord, you, you hadn't taught me right or something's not right about this. He, he wasn't saying that. And he was saying, as John taught his disciples, it wasn't that he was jealous of John's disciples or that he wanted to go over where John's disciples were to try to get what John's disciples had. What he wanted to do was to get the teaching he needed from Jesus to be just as blessed as somebody else. We have to be willing to know that when somebody else is blessed, don't be jealous of their blessings. Just find out what they're doing so that you can do it, too, because God has just as much for you as he does for them. I, I don't know if he heard John's people pray or seen some type of result from their prayer, prayer, but he wants what he saw in John's disciple bad enough that, that he doesn't get jealous of their ability, but he wants to have it to get it for himself and for the others. Sense of God, one of the problems with this modern day life is when we see what other people have, sometimes we get jealous about it. But understand, God has blessings for everybody. He can bless us all at the same time. So you don't have to say, God, just bless me. God bless us. And in this scripture, and we're going to close. In the scripture, he also uh, says, Lord, that's the first thing he does. And he says, Lord. Lord, he he said, I want to acknowledge you as Lord. And the key to the scripture is the first thing that's out of his mouth is Lord, not to teach us to pray or any of the rest. But what he's saying is Lord. He's acknowledging that he will submit whatever he has to God. He will submit God, whatever you tell me to do. That's what I'm going to do. We have to make sure that we're not just fixtures. We have to make sure that we are those who are praying and really know that there is a foundation to our prayer. There's a light switch in my house that I flick it up and down. There's two light switches. One works and the other one doesn't work. And I've checked in to see if I could have it fixed, or if I can have it taken care of. And I've been told by an electrician, says, well, this is a fixture that was probably for demo. 
and so it doesn't have anything where it works. Well, I said, okay, go ahead and fix it. So he says, no, I can't fix it. I'm gonna be honest with you. What I'd have to do is I would have to tear some things up and tear out the wall and do all this to be able to run something to make that work. I would have to do, do something to hook that up and to make that work. Child of God, here's what I'm saying. Sometimes God has to tear some stuff up in our lives and connect our prayer to the right source so that it will work. Sometimes there's some things that have to be torn down in order for our prayer to be effective, in order for our prayer to really get through. He's got to tear down some walls. He's got to put some dirt on the floor. He's got to mess up your life. But we don't because we don't want to be a cute fixture. I, I know that we're supposed to pray, but listen, you want to, God to give you the power in your prayer so that not only your prayers will be answered, so that you will have the priest, that the peace that you need so that when God moves or if God doesn't move, you still know that he's able. He wants to be the key. He wants to be the power and the source in prayer so that you can have the, continue to have the success that you need in life. Listen, it's one thing uh, to have call Jesus Lord, but you cannot call him Lord unless he is first your savior. And the only way you can be your savior is you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is the son of God. He died for your sins and he was raised from, raised from the dead by Jesus, by God. Then you shall be saved. That's what my Bible says. So today we want to make sure that you understand your prayers are more powerful when you hook to the source as a disciple of Jesus Christ. We want to extend that and make sure you understand that today because prayer is key and prayer is important. And it is the communication and the lifeline you have to God. Listen, we want to bless you and thank God for you today. Continue to do what's necessary to be uh, tied to Christ and tied to God and tied to your salvation so that God will get the glory from your life. God bless you.